Nobody wants a boss. Everybody wants a coach. Okay? I, I want to talk to you now about how to be a coach. Number one, I coach momentum. Folks, the difference in the great coaches and the average and ordinary coaches is the ability to get momentum and to keep momentum. Think about this, folks. A.O. Williams, for 20 consecutive years, grew. Now, during those 20 consecutive years, we changed companies five times. I had to terminate the number one producer in our company on two different occasions, and it was almost impossible to get terminated, you know, from A.O. Williams. We had wars with the regulators. We were kicked out of Mississippi for two weeks. Canada passed a rule where there was no uh, part-time recruits. Texas limited the number of recruits so we could 350 a year. And with all of that, A.O. Williams grew for 20 straight years. Now, how do you grow? This is the difference in a pro, a real pro, and an average and ordinary coach. There are three things you do now to guarantee you keep momentum when you get it going. Number one, you grow by multiplication. You've got to always be promoting people to district leader, to division leader, to RBP, okay? Because once you get things growing by multiplication, then what you have, or you have hundreds then, hundreds or thousands of people that are doing what you are trying to do, okay? Building friends, praise and recognizing people, recruiting best friends. Does that make sense? Yes. And see, once you have, once you're growing by multiplication, that's the greatest opportunity for you to keep that momentum that you've kept. Okay? Does that make sense? Yes. All right. Number two, the second thing in keeping this momentum, once you have it, is you've got to have an enemy. You've got to have some kind of injustice out there you're trying to create. You know, you've got to have an edge. I don't care if you're in the, in the real estate business, right? If somebody's charging, charging a, let's say, a 10% commission on just raw land that you sell out there, then you do it for 8.5% or something, right? You've got to have an edge over the enemy. You've got to have an enemy you're trying to beat out there, right? Now, we were fortunate to have the worst enemy in the whole history of the world, right? The trash value guys, right? But, but you're selling a crusade. There's nothing that energizes people and keep that momentum going like a, like a crusade, right? You're out there trying to save the world. You're trying to make a difference with your life, right? And then the third thing is you have competition inside the company. I was a master at promoting competition inside the company. I had a gift of always egging people along, uh, along a little bit, okay? So if you want to, if you want to keep momentum, once you get it, there are three keys. You grow by multiplication. You keep recruiting. Listen to this, folks. For 20 years, as President A.O. Williams, the first thing I looked for every day on my desk, Kathy Herring, my secretary, the first thing I did when I went in the office before I talked to Bo or anybody and got in, and got in my million things I needed to do, okay? The first thing I did every morning was look at recruiting numbers. First thing I did every morning. The second thing I did was sign 200 go-go letters. That's the first thing I did and got that out of the way, first thing every morning, right? And so you've got to have a way, I'm gonna talk to you about that in a morning, to monitor this kind of stuff. So when you know, you anticipate when you are slowing down, right? When you're, when you're fixing to hit a brick wall down the road, correct? So if, you, if you're growing by multiplication, if you've got people out there recruiting best friends, you're picking up policies of best friends, you know, uh, making presentations to best friends, building friends with their recruits, praising, recognizing people, promoting district managers, promoting division managers, promoting RBPs, and you've got people and you're teaching people how to do all these same kind of things to build these powerful relationships, right? then you're guaranteed that you're going to keep that momentum going. If you have an enemy, you've got to have an enemy. You've got to have something you can get people riled up about. And then the third thing is you create competition inside 
your own organization or inside the company, right? I mean, you can do something stupid like all you got to do is come out with a leader's bulletin. Just in your own region, if you've only got 15 people in your region, but you come out with a leader's bulletin, it is amazing how somebody inside of that wants to be number one, right? Or they want to be the guy in, in top of them this year. And, and, and then to carry that further, you know, you can have a turkey of the month on your leader's bulletin. And nobody wants to be turkey of the month, right? So, so what? Does that make sense? You know, you've got to create competition inside of your organization. Now, once you've lost momentum, once you've lost momentum, how do you, now, and I'm talking about when we grew for 20 straight years, that don't mean you're going to grow every month. You understand that? But, but once you lose momentum now, how do you capture momentum again? You always do things in bunches, okay? Like as an example, if, you're, if, you're, if your region, let's say, it, your organization, your base shop is supposed to do 20 recruits, and you're rocking along and you're doing 20 recruits, okay? You do 22 next month, you do 21, you do 25, then all of a sudden you do 12. Then all of a sudden you do nine. Then boy, you got a problem, right? So you can have great income out here. Everything can be looking hunky-dory. People can get, be getting promotions. They can be making lots of money. But all of a sudden, you see a disaster coming, right? And so when you see that happen, then the immediately what you do is you call an emergency meeting and you identify the problem. You call them in and say, now listen, team, look here. We were rocking along. We're supposed to be recruiting 20 people every month. Our incomes are great. We're getting promotions. Now the last two months, we let that slip. And so what we've got to do is we've got to get our recruiting back up. We've got to not only just get back to 20, but we've got to make up these that we've lost, right? And so let's say in your district, your goal is to uh, recruit two people a month. And this other person's division is the goal to recruit three people a month, right? And so what you do is you go on 30-day or 90-day blitzes, okay? And you say, okay, so, so let's say your, your goal is to do two a month. So let's say for the next uh, 90 days, we're going to try to recruit four, four, and four. And you're going to try to recruit six, six, and six. So you break it down just in small bites, okay? Or maybe you want to do a 30-day commitment and you've got a guy that's goal is two and three. You say, okay, why don't you try to go do six in 30 days? And you try to go do 10 in 30 days. And then you get that momentum built back up, okay, because you feel that pipeline and then you go take off again. And then the three things that keeps your momentum going is growing by multiplication, right? Keep recruiting those best friends. Keep promoting people to district division, RVP, right? And then have an enemy, some correct, some injustice you're trying to correct, and then create competition inside your team or inside the company. And if you do that, then you'll keep the momentum going forever. And so in order to do that, then you've got to have a monitoring system in place, right? And so, so one thing that, that uh, I monitored, like I said, the first thing I did for 20 years is I looked at recruiting. I was fanatical about recruiting. If I was always had my recruiting numbers, then I knew everything else was going to be okay, okay? If I wanted to add something else to that, I might look at promotions, okay? That would be an easy thing to monitor. And another thing would be uh, policy pickups is another thing I've monitored from time to time, right? But the main thing is recruiting. But you get one, two, or three things from an activity standpoint that you're gonna monitor and you monitor that every day or every week. And then when you see things headed down, then you call an emergency meeting and then you do something for 30 days or you do something for 90 days, right? Have a contest. It might be if you hit these recruiting numbers, then I'll take you to a ball game or we'll have a party or I'll take you to Hawaii or you know, something, okay? You just keep things stirred up, right? You keep it going and then when things slow down, when you're not hitting your recruiting numbers or your promotion numbers, then you call an emergency meeting, you identify the problem, you say, now, fellas, look, Dad Gummit, you know, we're down here, okay? And I'm part of the problem. I, you know, I only recruited two people last month. I was supposed to be recruiting five, so this month I'm going to try to go out and do 10, right? You always do it first, but then you identify the problem, do it in 30 days or 90 days. And then the last thing on momentum, 
is folks always remember, don't panic as the codes. Things are never as good as they seem and things are never as bad as they seem. As an example, two seminars ago, I had a guy here that was a former butcher from Minneapolis. Y'all probably know him. He was paid $750,000 last year. But he said a couple, three years ago, he lost his best guy, and the guy went out and replaced some of his business, and he had a $10,000 charge bag, and he thought it was going to run him out of business, and it almost drove him crazy. But he continued to fight. Things are never as bad as they seem. You're always one recruit away from an explosion, right? A couple of years later, he was paid $650,000. And last year, he was paid $750,000. So things are never when you have your best guy quit, when a client says no, things are never as bad as they seem. Don't panic. Hang in there. Keep doing the right kind of things, right? At the same time, things are never as good as they seem. If things are going great and you've got great income, your people got great income, attitudes are fantastic, just get ready. You're going to get killed. Folks, you're always one day away from a disaster. I mean, tomorrow you could get killed, right? So you can't ever do enough. You can't ever recruit enough. You can't ever sell enough. You can't ever make enough. You can't ever save enough. Is that right? But remember, you're always one recruit away from, a, from an explosion. Let me tell you, one of these guys, these 21 people that I talked to up here, now there's 21 letters I sent out when I first went to... Uh, Atlanta, one of the 12 people that I recruited, his name was Robert Sapp, Coach Sapp. He was a great guy and a great baseball coach. He went on, he was at Lilburn High School then, but he went on to a small college in Georgia and won three national championships and became the head baseball coach at the University of Georgia. But he loved A.O. Williams and he loved what we did for people and he loved to hear me talk and to make sales. And uh, he couldn't stand to make sales. But he had so many contacts, it was unbelievable. So I gave, I'll bet you I made 45 to 50 sales for Robert Sapp. Now, generally, you can't do that to a person, right? But he had such unbelievable contacts. It was taking me to such unbelievable quality of people that I gave him like one night a week, and I went with him for months, and I made 45 to 50 sales from him. And, and there's no telling how many RVPs I got off him, you know? And so, folks, you're just one person away from an explosion. So don't panic in this business, right? This is a business of momentum. You've got to have the ability to capture momentum and keep momentum. And you've got to have a system in place to tell you when you've got warning signs ahead. Does that make sense? Number two. I sell the toughness of this business up front. I sell the toughness of this business. Most coaches, they go out and recruit, and they only talk about the good things, the pretty things. I talk about the toughness of this business. I used to tell my football team, said, fellas, you see those guys in the wrong color jerseys down there? Now, now they're not going to say, y'all come out and just have fun tonight. You just, just run all over us, just score all the touchdowns you want, make us look like idiots out in front of all our fans. They ain't going to do that, right? They, they going to try to knock your dad gum head off, right? You better re be, be ready to play, right? Well, same way with Prudential and the Trash Valley guys. You know, it always amazed me how some of our people would get upset when the Trash Valley guys said something ugly about them. Why would anybody get upset if the people in the wrong color jerseys don't like you? The people that are trying to knock your head off, right? I used to tell our guys, hey, look, you think, what do you expect them to say? Well, what do you expect them to say? I'm so happy you're replacing my business. I'm so happy you're taking my renewals. You grow up, right? Oh, what are they going to say? Hey, Williams is scum. He's been in prison. They've been outlawed 98 states. You want to see the local A.O. Williams office? There's a trailer hitched up to a car right outside the city limits, right? They had a parade one time in Tucson. And the local life underwriters, you know, were riding down in a, in a, in a 
wagon, you know, with cowboy hats and all that crap, right? And they were dragging a dummy with a rope around his neck off the back of the trailer with A.L. Williams across his chest. Ain't that something? Hey, ain't that something? I mean, I love it, right? I mean, they trying to knock our head off. We're trying to knock their head off, right? Ain't that right? See, see, you better be tough to win, right? Just look at the odds. Think about this, folks. 98% of the people not going to make it big. Now, now, that tells you something right there, right? Everybody wants to make it big, right? Well, why does only 2% of the people make it big? Because it's tough, right? It's too tough for most people. Listen to this one. Less than 2% of the people have a household income of more than $100,000. That's husband and wife. Less than 2%. Now, that, that, did I tell you how tough it is to make over $100,000? Listen to this one. Two-tenths of 1% 1 of the people become financially independent. How about that? You think it's easy? Well, 99.8% of the people out there ain't going to ever do it. That's how easy it is, right? You better be tough, right? First 18 months, you come in this business, everything's going to turn to crap, right? Just get ready, right? See, folks, life will give you what you will accept. If you'll accept being average and ordinary, if you'll accept being unhappy, if you'll accept having financial problems, that's exactly what life's going to give you. You've got to demand for yourself. You've got to fight for success, right? It's going to be tough, right? See, one reason A.L. Williams did so great is because we were just tougher than everybody else. We were just downright tougher than everybody else. It wasn't that we were smarter. It wasn't that we were prettier. We just wanted it more. We'd fight your fanny. We'd knock your head off, right? You know, my football team, the proudest thing I had is my record as a head coach is I never had to call time out to drag one of my players off the field. That's a true story. I got a lawyer, his name is Alex Johnson in Baxley right now that broke his leg. We didn't know it was broke, but he wobbled off the field. Next day, went and got an x-ray and found out his leg was broke. And he was too scared to call time out thinking that nobody would come get him because that's what I told him for every game. I said, fellas, listen, when I talk to the referees, I tell them, I said, Mr. Ref, see those guys in the wrong colored jerseys? They ain't as tough as us. They don't love it like us. They don't want it like us. Mr. Ref, I've never had to call time out to drag one of my players off the field. Mr. Ref, if one of my guys get hurt, I want you to know I ain't coming out there and I ain't letting none of my people come out there. You got to move the ball over to the other side of the field and play a little bit so they can crawl themselves off the field. Told him that every game. Never had one guy lay out there on the field. It's tough, right? But, but for people like me, right? That I wanted to be, I thank goodness it's tough, right? If it wasn't tough, it, all the people here would make it. Ain't that right? Ain't that right? I mean, the tougher the better, right? Because it gives me a chance, right? See, I sell the toughness of the business. Number three, I coach commitment and loyalty. See, relationships of commitment and loyalty is everything. Let me tell you another story that'll tear you up. Remember that uh, time I told you about when we had World War III, when I left Waddell and Reed, I called Bob Strader. I said, I'm going. I hung up the phone. They had a plane of executives come down from Kansas City and Boston. They set up their war room in the hotel across the street in Waddell and Reed office. And we were just fighting each other for the people, you know. I was working these marathon hours. Friday night, about 8 o'clock, I heard a knock at the back door. And it was Trudy White, the secretary in our Tallahassee office. When I became the RVP of the Southeast with Waddell and Reed, she was a secretary in Fort Lauderdale. When Coach Taylor, my hero in life, the most important person in my life next to my parents, retired from coaching, I hired him to work for A.O. Williams. And he opened an office in Tallahassee. So he didn't know nothing. So I brought Trudy White, who had been at Waddell and Reed for 30 years up there because she knew how to 
you know, process the business and all that kind of stuff, right? Here was a secretary. Now I'm going around telling people we probably ain't gonna make it. The odds are about like this of us making it, right? And here I get a knock at my door and it's Trudy White. And I said, Trudy, what, what are you doing? She said, I'm coming. And I said, uh, no, you ain't. You ain't coming, Trudy. You think you're coming? You crazy. I said, chances are we ain't going to make it. You got 10 years to retirement. You know, you got a salary. You got a hospitalization. You got a retirement program. You only got 10 years to go to retirement. And we're starting a new company. We probably ain't going to make it. You think I'm going to let you come? You crazy. You ain't coming. She said, I'm coming. And I said, ain't no way you coming, Trudy. I said, ain't no, she said, I'm coming. She spent Friday night with me. She spent Saturday night with me. And by Sunday night, she had worn me out. And she came. Is that hard to believe now? You can understand why Rusty Crossland and Bill Lorenda and Bob Miller and some of these people, because there's a chance if we make it big, them doing something gigantic, right? But Trudy White was a secretary. She wasn't going to participate in the gigantic financial rewards down the road, right? She was just going to be an employee. She was our first employee. See, see, to build commitment and loyalty, folks, you've got to get involved with your people's lives. I love Trudy. I made her feel like the most important person in A.O. Williams. She loved me. We loved each other. There was a bonding there. You've got to get involved in your people's lives. You've got to get to know their family. You've got to get to know their dreams. You've got to show them and tell them that you care about them, that you believe in them. I was reading the paper when I was thinking about doing this part, and I cut this article out. This was about four or five weeks ago of the Atlanta paper. It was talking about the new coach at the University of Florida. You know, he was at, he was at Utah last year, and the SEC has had a horrible summer of uh, football players getting in all kind of trouble at Tennessee and Georgia and South Carolina, and they're having to run them off and all this kind of stuff, you know. And, and they had this article. I thought it was very interesting. They said, uh, bar brawls, burglary, battery, DUI, academic fraud, aggravated assault, reckless endangerment, transportation of steroids. It's been one humiliating headline after another this offseason around the SEC with at least 23 football players either arrested or cited at South Carolina, Tennessee, and Georgia alone. Meanwhile, down in Gainesville, it's been peaceful. And look at what Myers said. This is the head coach it said down there. He said, Myers' assistants have to bind to his hands-on approach to player management. His position coaches, that means his defensive line coach, his defensive back coach, offensive coordinator, defensive coordinator, his position coaches must not only know their players well, but they must know their players' girlfriends. They must know their players' parents, they, and they must know their players' friends, and they must have their players' cell phone number. They have to drop in unannounced to the dorm room two or three times a week just to visit with the players. Is that incredible? See, see, in building this loyalty, this trusting relationship, you've got to get in your people's lives. Let, let me uh, show you a coach's secret that I saw this year that I like. Would y'all come up here, y'all three? My, my granddaughter, I got a granddaughter that's so gorgeous. She's uh, 15 years old. She was a sophomore, and she looks like a Hollywood movie star. She can sing better than Celine Dion. And she's got the greatest three-point shot you've ever saw. She set the all-time school record as a three as a three-point basketball shooter. Just unbelievable. But anyway, they had a highlight film that they showed at the banquet. And this is what I got out of that highlight film: this coach showing his girls that he loves them. Every, before every game, he calls the team together and he says, Take your knee. They all get in a circle. Y'all take your knee. This is going to be worse on me than y'all, okay? And they get in a circle. Let's get in a circle. And they all hold hands. And he starts off and he says, uh, girls, I'm so proud of you. I love you. I, I, I want you to know that there's not another team in the United States I'd rather coach. I wouldn't leave you for anything. I, lo I love your spirit. I love your toughness. I love your commitment to what we're all about. I just love everything about you. I'm so proud of you, and I know you're going to give us everything you've got tonight. 
John, I love you, John. I love you as my teammate. I love you being in that foxhole next to me because I know I can trust you. And then John, then you say something to Michael. Well, Michael, I just, I was practiced so much. You've been next to my side. And I know that as we go out tonight to fight, we're going to fight together. We're going to fight for one goal that we've worked for all, all this time. I'll be there next to you. Big tenth. Earl, I love you as a brother and teammate. And I'm going to give you everything I got tonight. I know you're going to give the team everything you got tonight. And I know we're going to come out of this giving our best. And we do that. I know that our best is going to win. Thank you, Adam. That's awesome. Now, is that... See, folks, the number one thing I learned, that's pretty powerful, right? When I tell you that, the number one thing I learned at A.O. Williams and in coaching football is the trusting relationships you build with people is everything. Does that make sense? If your people trust you and believe in you, you can conquer the world. If you believe in your people and trust them, you can conquer the world. Without it, you'll never be successful. I coach an incredible work ethic. I coach an incredible work ethic. See, I believe, I believe great leaders always lead for the front, so I've never asked anybody to do anything that I hadn't done, right? And I lead by example. And I demand toughness from me I work unbelievably hard, and I demand toughness from you. You understand that? I mean, fellas, if you make a commitment to me, if you commit to A.L. Williams, if you're going to make this your thing, okay, then I want you to know together we're going to do it, right? And, folks, I'm not going to pansy out. You understand that? I'm not going to give up on you. And I don't want you to give up, right? And together, we're going we to win. You understand that, right? But, is, but I demand toughness. I'm going to give you toughness. You know, Gary Player said something that meant a lot to me. It stuck with me all these years. He said, you know, he was the golfer that played and won in more international golf tournaments than any golfer in his era. That was when Jack Nicklaus and Arnold Palmer were king. And Gary Player said, you know, I played in golf tournaments all over the world, and people are the same everywhere. And he said, every golf tournament I play in, I have some person who's been trying to play golf come up and say, man, Gary, I'd give anything if I could hit a golf ball like you. And he said, one day I'd had a particularly bad round, and somebody said that, and I turned around, and I said, no, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. You'd give anything to hit, hit a golf ball like me if it was easy. Well, you know what it takes to hit a golf ball like me? You got to go down. You got to wake up at 5.30 in the morning. You go down and you hit a thousand golf balls. You hit so many golf balls till your hand starts bleeding. You walk up to the clubhouse. You wash that blood off your hand. You put a bandage on it. You go down and you hit another thousand golf balls. See, nothing good comes easy. Nothing good comes easy. See, see, I, I, I found this principle, this, 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 this little bit more uh, with two RVPs in Dallas, Texas. I'd mention one name. I've never disclosed him. I won't, you know, because both of them are good friends of mine. But uh, you would know one of them. But one was paid $500,000 this particular year, and one was paid $50,000. And I looked at both of them, and every single thing I could look at on the outside was the same. They were the same sex. They were almost identically the same age. They worked in the same city, same state. Same company sold the same products. They, 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 everything looked the same, and they did everything that you're supposed to do to win. Both of them did. They were good people, good family people, treated their people good. They made money. They saved money. They did everything you're supposed to to win. Everything looked like the same on the outside, and they both did everything you're supposed to to win. Why would one make five hundred thousand and one make fifty thousand? With well, a $500,000 a year leader, did everything he's supposed to and a little bit more. He worked hard and a little bit more. He made money and a little bit more. He saved money and a little bit more. If you want to win, you've got to do a little bit more. The third thing I learned in my career in coaching football and coaching A.L. Williams is you've got to reward and punish yourself. You know, in coaching, 
I had something on Thursday before we did battle on Friday night at our victory meeting. I set our goals up, and if we won by 21 points, had a great offensive game, or if we won and held a team scoreless, we would go out in shorts on Monday. If we just won, but we let them score, or we didn't beat them by 21 points, we went out in pads on Monday because we had to get better. We didn't make our goals. That was our punishment. If we lost, we came to work on Saturday, and we had to punish ourselves. Well, when I, when I went in business, I, stare, I carried the same concept to me. Back when I was recruiting these greenies and building that first base shop with ITT in, in uh, Atlanta, I had a goal of putting my name on five sales a week. I did that for years and recruiting three people every week. That's me, myself, okay? My goal, if I did, if I did that by Friday, then I would take Saturday and Sunday off and spend with the family. But if it got to Friday and I'd only had four sales and let's say two recruits, then I worked Saturday and I worked Sunday afternoon. And the next week, I had to make that up. I couldn't just go back and get five and three because I'm one behind, right? I started losing streak. I had to go get six and four the next week to be able to take Saturday and Sunday off, right? Now, folks, I wouldn't be honest with you if I said that I did that all my career, okay? I tried to. I tried to always have a reward and punishment system in place for me. And there were times that I screwed off, okay? I just wasn't tough enough to do it every week. But I thought about it. And many weeks I did that. Folks, I'm 63 years old. Even today, 63 years old, I never stop at the finish line. I exercise six days a week, maybe seven days a week generally, but six days every week. I never stop at the finish line. It is so programmed in me, this doing a little bit more, this reward and punishment, that, that if I'm jogging three miles, I can't stop at the three-mile line. I have to go to the next telephone pole or another 10 yards or another 100 yards. This morning, I got on the treadmill at 6.30. I did a 45-minute workout on the treadmill. I knew I was speaking to you. I, had, I, I, put, I put another 10 minutes on the treadmill at a higher elevation and a faster pace to punish myself, to get ready just for today. I wanted to be up. I wanted to be tough. I wanted to be mentally ready today. I never stopped at the finish line. I used to tell my football team, because I coach toughness. I mean, I understand the odds. I'm a two percenter. I'm a two tenths of one percenter. I'm financially independent. You understand that? I love it being tough. Because if it wasn't tough, I couldn't make it. You understand that? I understand that, right? I'm willing to shovel the crap that these pretty people ain't willing to do. You understand that? I used to tell my football team before every football camp, the worst experience of a football player's life is out there in August when it's hot and you're going through two or three day practices in football camp. And I used to tell my football player, I said, hey, fellas, I want to tell you something. You, tomorrow it's going to be so hot and, and coach is going to be chewing on you and you're going to think if you take one more step, you're going to die, okay? Well, I want you to know, I don't know why the good Lord did it, but he put something in your mechanism up here that right before you die, you pass out. And, and so I don't want you to worry about dying. I want you, tomorrow, I want you to know when, when I say, okay, fellas, let's line up, we finish new wind sprints. And you say, I, I can't take another step, I'm gonna die. Hey, I just can't, I just, don't worry about it. You just get up there and run as hard as you can run because right before you die, you're gonna pass out. And I'll get a trainer to take you up to the dress room and throw you in the cold shower and give you some salt tablets and you'll be ready to practice this afternoon, right? <laughs> Folks, I want you to know, if you're going to play on my team, we're tough. We're tougher than anybody else. We want it more than anybody else. At number five, I coach people to become master motivators. You know, I did a research paper for my master's degree at Auburn University, and the title of it was How to Motivate the High School Athlete. And I used as an analogy an English teacher friend of mine that 
I would uh, talk to it in the, in the teacher's lounge, you know, at break, and she was always complaining about the kids not doing their homework. She said, you know, I, I think the younger generation is just going to heck. I can't get the kids excited about English. I can't get them to do 30 minutes of homework, you know, in English. And so after hearing that and thinking about the sacrifice and the effort my football players paid, I wrote my paper for my master's degree at Auburn on that contrast. And I started thinking about the typical English teacher. You know, to graduate and to get your degree from high school, you have to take English. This is something the kids have to take. So that English teacher has a pretty powerful hold on them, right? That if you don't do your homework, if you don't pay attention in class, if you don't learn this English, I'm going to give you an F and you ain't going to graduate. She's got a pretty uh, good hold on those kids, right? And here you've got a football coach. Kids have to volunteer to come out to play football. There's no credit. You don't have to play football to, to get your degree from high school, okay? It's strictly something that you volunteer to do. And so you, th you think about the football players on my team, that even after the season, when there's no fans in the stand, when there's no names in the newspaper, you know, no crowds cheering them on, uh, they come down to that weight room, and they put on their workout outfits and they go in there and they pump those weights, you know, for maybe an hour or hour and a half. And then every other day we're working on cardiovascular, you know, where I've got them running up hills or pulling tires, you know, or with a rope around their waist, race, you know, over the football field. And, and they're just punishing their body for hours and hours and hours to be a better football player. And so in thinking this out, I said, how can a football coach get that kind of effort and an English teacher can't get their kids excited about English? And I came to the conclusion that it's all about leadership. It comes down to the leader. The typical English teacher I know sits behind their desk and they never get excited about English. They never show any excitement. They, they talk in the same tone the whole time, you know. And it's just more of a business for an English teacher. They're, they're going to put in their 45 or 50 minutes, and that's pretty much it. Where, where you take a typical football coach, man, he's involved with the kids. I mean, he spends hours at night watching game films. You know, he, he, he's, going to, he's going to coaching clinics to try to listen to these different coach of the years, you know, that have different ideas about offense and defense to get any information he can to make his team better, you know, the next year. He, you know, he dresses out and works out with the kids. When they have a great victory, jumps in the shower and celebrates with the kids. When they have a terrifying loss, he, he cries with the kids. He, get emo he gets emotionally involved with the kids. And I think if an English teacher had the same kind of attitude where they got emotionally involved with the kids. Maybe they have to stand up on top of the desk and, and yell and holler and get excited about English and throw a, a racer and a piece of chalk. And, but all of a sudden, you'd see kids get excited about English. To build a championship team, you've got to become a master motivator. And there are two keys. Number one, you've got to become an expert on praise and recognition. Folks, I believe everybody wants to be somebody. You know, every person that's ever been born at some time in their life, usually when they're kids, they're dreamers. We all, when we were kids, we were dreaming about being a sheriff or an NFL quarterback or an astronaut or President of the United States or Miss America. We were all dreamers. We were all pumped up about life. I had the privilege of coaching in high school, and it seems to me that the peak years for most people to dream and be excited are their high school years. When those guys and gals would come into the ninth grade, man, their eyes were as big as a baseball. Man, man, they started getting their driver's license and driving. They started dating. They were playing on athletic teams before hundreds or thousands of people. They had people making them feel like a hero. Man, they were pumped up. Life was a bowl of cherries. They felt great about themselves. They felt they were put on this earth to make a difference. And then they graduate, and they get dumped out in the big, bad world. 
and people start lying to them and using them and screwing them and they get married and they have a kid and they get a job and they change jobs and they have another kid and then one day this vibrant, pumped up, turned on human being becomes a shell of a man and he rolls out of bed and his foot hits the floor and they change their attitude about themselves. They developed an attitude that life's dealt me a bad hand, that I've just got to take it. I've got a wife and kids now. I've just got to, I don't like my boss. I don't like my job. I just don't like my future. But, but I've got responsibilities, and I, I, that's just the way life is. I, I've just got to take it. I just got to show up and take it. Folks, your great challenge is 90% of the people that come to work for you are going to be hurt. They've going to lose some of their confidence. It, it Maybe on the outside, they look confident, but inside, they've been hurt. And, and somehow, you've got to help them believe in themselves again, feel good about themselves again. And the first key to doing that is become an expert on praise and recognition. You've got to become an expert in looking for the good things in these people. And every time you see something good, you praise them. You recognize them. You make them feel special. Be very creative. And always remember to do your recognition in public. Number two, always let your people know that you're looking out for them. Always put your people first. Always let your people know that you work for them. Don't you ever, nowhere, no time ever have an atti even an attitude, much less verbalize something to your people that they're working for you, that they're working to make you more money, that they're working to make you a better, ba bigger base job, that they're working to help you win a contest. That's the worst sin you can, you, can, you can commit as a coach. You always let your people know that in this company, on your team, the only way for you to get the biggest rewards is help them succeed. The only way you uh, get promotions, the only way you win contests is to help them get promotions, to help them win contests. I motivate people, number six, to believe in themselves. See, I believe the single most important thing to winning is the power of believing in you, the power of believing that you can win, the power of believing that good things will happen to you, the power of believing that you're special. See, folks, I believe the biggest single obstacle to success is not lack of education, it's not lack of background, it's not lack of money, it's lack of belief in yourself. How do you get these people that are all torn up? Their confidence is all torn up. How do you get these hurting people to believe in themselves? I think there's two key steps. Number one, I believe you've got to demand from them total commitment. As a coach, I demand total commitment. Most people go into business and they say, well, I'll give it a look-see. I'll try it out. I'll stick my toe in it. And then, boy, if I make all these sales and I make all this money and I get all these promotions, then I'll jump in with both feet and go whole hog. Not on my team, you don't. See, see that, ain't the word. that ain't the way it works. See, the first step to winning in business is you got to make a total commitment just like in marriage. The, 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 the key to having a successful marriage is when you stand up and say, I do, then that's a total commitment. Then, then, then just like in marriage, you, you know, things are not always going to go hunky-dory, you know? You, I love Angel more than anything in the world. I fell in love with her in the second grade. I've been married to her for 45 years. I enjoy her more today, love her more today than I ever have. But I don't like her all the time, and she don't like me all the time. And see, folks, when you're married to somebody, you know you ain't going to like them all the time. Ain't that right? 
But, but when you make a total commitment, you work through all that crap. Ain't that right? Well, it's the same thing in business. If you go come to, if you go come on this team, if you want to put this uniform on, then Dad, government, the first step is total commitment. I don't want you to stick your toe in it. I ain't gonna give you everything I got unless you're willing to give me everything you got, right? And together, you give me everything you got, and I give you everything I got. Then, folks, we gonna go to war and we gonna do something, right? That's the way you help get people to believe in themselves, to make a total commitment for one, to one thing. Most people haven't done that since being married or, or since high school. Isn't that right? Now, that was worth the trip right there, right? Now, the second way to get people, the second way to get these hurting people to believe in themselves again is, folks, listen to this. You can't totally believe in yourself until you've accomplished, accomplished something important to you. See, I am a big believer, folks, that ultimately you've got to have some kind of success, right? You just can't go forever getting beat around and put down and continue to believe in yourself, right? That's what, what I talked about, about loaning money. I tell people, I'm going to give you everything I got. I might give you money, okay? In fact, I've, I've, given, I've given lots of money, okay, away. But when you loan people money, it just seems in my experience that that's nothing but a temporary fix. It's somewhere down the road, they're going to have an opportunity again to where they're going to need money, okay? Now, folks, I want to help you from day one fix that permanently, okay? Dad coming, I don't want you being in a situation where you got financial problems and you got a crisis, you know, where you got to go out there and make panic management decisions, you know, and all that kind of stuff because of financial problems, right? Dad, gummit, we're going to set up right now a system where you're going to have success. I want to put you on a success system. And the first thing I do with them is, is, is I make a commitment. I, I'm probably the best salesman in the history of the world. You understand that? I mean, I can't hardly miss a sale. You understand that? And you go have me selling for you. I mean, I'm going to go to your best friends and I'm going to sell for you as long as it takes for you to make some money. And then the next thing I'm going to do is I'm probably the best recruiter in the history of the world. And, and you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go to your, 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 your warm market and I'm going to sell for you and help you make some money. And then I'm going to recruit people for you to help you build a team where you begin to get a little override, right? And then I'm going to begin to go to that best friend's best friend's house, and we're going to recruit him too. And before you know it, we're going to have multiple people out there with multiple prospects for you where you're going to have a lot of success, right? I'm going to teach you from day one to win. Because this is a business of winning, right? I demand total commitment, and I, and, I, and I have an incredible work ethic, right? I'm going to pay an incredible price. This is not a fun and games thing to me. I love it. This is my life. I ain't going nowhere else. This is where I pitch my tent. I don't have any other options. So, folks, we are going to win. You understand? If you join me, if you join this team, we're going to flat get it all, and I'm going to see that you win. You understand that? Because me and you are together. This is a team, right? And we're going to kick Prudential's butt. You understand that? We're going to do something important together. You understand that? That's the way you help get people to believe in themselves. They got you demand a total commitment. And then you take that individual and you take him out there and you do whatever's necessary for him to have some success where he can look in the mirror and say, man, I'm winning. I'm winning again in my life. That's the way you get people to believe in themselves. I believe number seven, you learn by making mistakes. There's nothing burns my butt more than some of these bosses. You know, when you make a mistake, what they want to do is jump all over you and, you know, demote you and all that kind of crap, right? Well, folks, they don't make no perfect person, right? 
See, see, you learn by making mistakes. You, you know, in a football game, there's uh, about 120 plays in a high school football game. Now, you know, every play is designed to work every time. You understand that? If you draw up a play, if I draw up a play, let's say fullback over strong tackle, this guy blocks down, this guy blocks down, this guy blocks out, this guy runs right here. And if everybody does what they're supposed to, that play's supposed to work. You understand that? But in a football game out of 120 plays, there's only four or five plays that work like they're supposed to. See, see only four or five plays determines who's going to win that game. Ain't that something? But, but you know what? The team that wins believes every play is going to work. When, when you call a play, all the teammates have got to feel like this is the play. This is going to be one of those four or five plays. And they got to give it everything they got, right? Everybody's got to give it everything they got. And if it don't work, then they get the huddle, they call another play. And then everybody on that team believes this play is the play that's going to work, right? And everybody gives it everything they got. And if it don't work, you get in the huddle and you call another play. And everybody believes in that huddle that this is the play. This is going to be one of those four or five plays that's going to determine whether we win the game or not. I got to give it everything I got, right? You've got to have the courage to keep calling those plays, to keep calling those plays. And when things don't work, you keep calling those plays, right? And you expect that the next play is going to be the home run, right? You know, Benjamin, um, Abraham Lincoln had the greatest story of courage with defeat after defeat I've ever, I've ever heard. You know, it inspires me every time I look at it. Listen to this. In 1931, he failed in business. Now, most people that fail in business, you understand, most people will never try business again, right? They will absolutely say, it's just not meant to be. I just got to go take it. I'm just going to get a job that gives me a, a, a salary. And I'm going to provide as best I can for my family. I tried in business and I failed, right? Well, old Abe failed in 1931 in business. In 1930, 1832, he, he was defeated for legislature. 1833, he had his second failure in business. 1836, he suffered a nervous breakdown. In 1840, he was defeated for elector. In 1843, he was defeated for Congress. In 1848, he was defeated for Congress again. In 1855, he was defeated for Senate. In 1858, he was defeated for Vice President. In 1858, he was defeated for Senate again. And in 1860, he was elected President. Now, is that courage? Is that courage? That's what you've got to have. You learn by making mistakes. And, it, and nothing wears my butt out more if I'm out trying it. Nobody believes it more than me. Nobody loves this stuff more than me, right? And I give it everything I got, and I'm good at it. And then if some client says no, what am I going to do about that, right? I can't write to check for you, right? you got to keep calling those plays. You see, folks, when you lose a sale, when your best guy quits, it cuts your guts out. You understand that? For, for the first year and a half, uh, I didn't have a lot of confidence in my ability as a coach, you know, to be a salesperson and a business person anyway, you know. And when I went in a home and I made my presentation and somebody said no, folks, it just tore me up. I mean, I mean I'd put that old smile on my face. And I'd say everything you're supposed to say. I'd say, well, Bill, it's been great talking to you and Sue. And if you ever change your mind, you know, give me a call. And But you're great people. And I've enjoyed our time together. And I was gathering up all my stuff. And I was walking towards the door. Before I could get to the door, I was already beating up on Art Williams, you know. I was saying, Art, you are such a dog. I mean, why didn't you say this? Well, why didn't you do this? You're so stupid. Why? Why? Well, Art, 
why don't you just admit it? You ain't no good. Why don't you just throw in a towel and go on back and coach football for a living? For 18 months, a year and a half, I beat up on Art Williams like you can't believe every time I met Mr. Sale. And then something unbelievably dramatic happening and changed my life. I paid a death claim. All of a sudden, I carried a check for $150,000 to this widow and three kids. And I said, man, this thing really works. You know, had, had I not gone in there, if I hadn't gone in this business and I hadn't gone into that house, the same thing would have happened to that mom and those three babies that happened to my mama. It would have happened to Angela had I not seen the light. Boy, they're the luckiest people in the world have had Art Williams come into their house. Man, these people have a chance now. They have a chance now because of me. And something inside of me changed that day, 30-something years ago, and I never forgot it. And, and then I started thinking. I said, now, look, trash value is a ripoff, right? You, you lose your cash if you die. I mean, who wants to own some crap like that, right? And when I go in a house, I make two promises. I'm going to give you the same protection you now have and cut your cost 75 or 80% or I take the same dollars you're now spending if you don't have enough protection and give you eight to 10 times more value. I don't sell policies. I don't ask you to spend more money. I take the same dollars you're now spending and give you tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars more value, right? Well, when I leave the house, you ought to be kissing my dad gum feet, right? Ain't that, ain't that right? I mean, I had, I had a $15,000 trash value policy, $100 a month going to teacher's credit a year, and I took the same money. I got $150,000 of term, and I put $100 into a, an IRA with a mutual fund, right? I investigated this stuff. I studied this stuff. At one time in my life, I didn't know nothing about, but, about football, right? But I took the time. This thing changed my life when I saw it. Saw what happened to my daddy. Saw what happened to, to, to me. I went and investigated this stuff. I found out that by term and investor difference was right. It wasn't just a little right. It was right. It was right 100% of the time. Then I started talking to all my coaching friends and all my players' parents and all my teachers' friends and found out they had the same crap I had. And uh, so everything changed for me. I said, now, Art, You've investigated this thing as much as anybody could investigate something, and you found out the truth that by term and invest the difference is right, right? And you changed your program, right? And you walk in a house, and this guy and gal don't know nothing about insurance and investments, right? Now, they're good people. They know what they're doing, right? Like when I was a football coach, I, that's all I did, coach football. I expected an insurance agent or an investment person to take care of me, right? So, so when I walk in a house, I own by term and invest the difference, which is right, right? I've studied it and investigated it. I know it's right. And then I'm talking to somebody that don't know nothing. And so if I go in and explain it to him and I'm right and I own it and then somebody that don't know nothing says, no, does that make him right and me wrong? No, it took me 18 months to figure that out. And then all of a sudden I, 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 I changed. You know, I, I would go in there and I can talk, right? And man, I'd talk and I'd talk and I'd talk and I'd say, how's it sound? He said, no. And that old smile would come to my face. And I'd say, everything you're supposed to. Bill and Sue has been so great knowing you. Uh, I'm enjoying spending this time with you. If you ever change your mind, give me a call. I was good clicking all my stuff. And before I hit that door, I, I, I started thinking. I said, you know, I've met a lot of people in my life that are just plain dumb, you know? But, but I think of all the people I've ever met, those two people probably take the cake. 
That's probably the two dumbest folks I've ever met in my life. You know what? And they're just some dumb people out there. And you know what? Trash value is perfect for dumb people. And especially those dumb people, you know? Ain't that right? You see, I found out all you can do is all you can do. See, folks, you can't do no more than all you can do, right? That's the ultimate. All you can do is all you can do. But if you do all you can do, that's enough. That's enough for you to become financially independent. That's enough for you to help a lot of widows out there. That's enough for you to give your people a chance to go and business for themselves and build a family, a business that will give their family financial independence, right? Yeah, most plays ain't going to work. They all should work. Everybody ought to own buy term invest the difference. They ought to outlaw trash value life insurance, right? But thank the Lord they don't. Because how would I make a living? A ain't that right? And, but then if you got stupid people don't know nothing say no, then what you got to do? You got to keep calling those plays, right? And you got to believe the next play is going to be the one that's going to score the touchdown, right? And win the game, right? I coach people to have a sense of urgency. See, see, there's nothing worse, folks, than you go in there and recruit somebody, and then they, uh, you leave the house, and they don't, they don't, they say, "Well, I'll call you, and we'll set up something uh, in a week or two or three. or I've got a, I've got an opportunity meeting in a couple weeks. Uh, you think you might can come?" Man, if you're going to be a coach, you got to get a sense of urgency, right? I mean, hey, hey ain't no grass going to grow under my feet, right? You want to win, right? I'm going to win. You understand that? Hey, if you're serious, we're going to get after it like yesterday, right? Within 48 hours, I want you calling one of your best friends and setting up an appointment. We're going to see if this thing works, right? I mean, hey, you're joining a coach. Hey, then don't screw around. You understand that? Now, I, I ain't no pansy. I ain't looking for no pansies. You understand that? I hope this don't scare you off, but if it does, that's great. I want to get it straight on the front end, right? This is my life. I'm serious about this stuff, right? And if you're serious about winning, if you want to change your life, if you see something here that really rings your bell, right? Then, folks, I ain't playing. This ain't no game to me. We're going to get after it. I mean, folks, you got to start walking faster. You got to start talking faster. You got to start talking louder. I coach people to have a sense of urgency. I coach people to manage their attitude. Listen, folks, everybody has doubts and fears and negative thoughts. You know, I've met uh, two people in my life that were like towering, intimidating kind of people. It's pretty hard to intimidate me, you know? But, but I've met two people that when they walk in a room, it, it, it's almost something magical happens. One was President Reagan. And one was Coach Bryant at Alabama. It was just unbelievable how they could just sort of electrify a room. They just had so much, I don't know, charisma or whatever you call it, you know, but boy, they had it. But, but you know what I believe? I believe that I'm one of the most positive people you'll ever be around. I've worked hard at it over my life. And, you know, one of my goals is to be positive, totally positive, for 24 hours. And I'm 63 years old, and I ain't made it yet. You, you know, I get, I get a string going. I get a string going for eight hours or nine hours or 11 hours or 14 hours, and I start worrying about something. And I'm not supposed to, you understand? I know I'm not supposed to, but I reckon just being a human being, it just happens to me, you know? I get scared. I get worried. See, folks, I believe, the mo I believe President Reagan and Coach Bryant 
We're only positive and powerful for minutes or hours or maybe days at a time. And then they begin to worry and have doubts and have fears. And, and see, folks, that's life. And it's your ability, it's your ability in spite of being scared, in spite of having doubts, in spite of these negative thoughts getting in your mind, in spite of that happening to you probably every day, maybe some many times every day, in spite of that, a winner changes those doubts and fears and negative thoughts and gets back to his positive attitude, right? So, so it might hit you after 10 hours, 11 hours, you might have this negative thought come, and it's going to hit you, and it's going to worry you, and it's going to set you back, right? But then somehow a winner has got to change that and get his positive attitude back as quick as he can, right? But when you have those fears and doubts and worries, don't beat up on yourself and say, well, I'm a dog. I'm a loser. I was just, I, you know, there's something wrong with me. There ain't nothing wrong with you. You're just a human being, right? So how, how when you have negative thoughts and doubts and fears, how do you change that to get your positive attitude back? The, the first thing I teach people is remind yourself of your blessings. You know, remind yourself of your fabulous wife or husband, your unbelievable kids or your grandkids. Your good health. You know, one million people would die this week. And that you got enough to, you live in a country where you got enough to eat. You know, 75% of the world doesn't have enough to eat. They go to bed hungry every night. Two billion people on this earth can't read. You know, having a great friend, having great teammates, having a great income. You know, living in a country, my good friend was uh, talking to me last night at dinner, you know. Living in a country where, where people can really move from being a great picker to building a business where he's got a six-figure income and he's offering that same opportunity to other great pickers and people that are cutting drafts. And, they, and, and society looks at uh, most of the Hispanic community and says, you know, they're the laborers in our country. Isn't it wonderful to be able to stick your head up and say, not me? So, so that's the way you get out of you, you When you get down and you get negative and you get worried, remind yourself of all your blessings. So, see, you've got, to, you've, got to, you've got to make an effort, folks, to always be excited. I, I make a huge effort for my teammates to never see me negative. Now, again, let me say this, folks. Does that mean you're not supposed to chew on people? Does that mean you're not supposed to challenge people? Does that mean you're not supposed to kick people in the butt sometime? No, man, a coach has got to do that, right? And that's not negative. As long as I'm trying to make you better, if you need a kick in the butt, you ought to kiss my foot for kicking you in the butt. Ain't that right? Ain't that right? As long as I'm doing, I'm doing it with the right kind of attitude, that's positive, right? Even when I'm doing tough things, I try to put a positive spin on it, right? I'm trying to help you get better, right? Oh, this thing, this definition I heard, I think about it even today with my grandbabies. The de greatest definition of a winner I know that said, almost everybody can stay excited for two or three months. A few people can stay excited for two or three years. But a winner will stay excited forever. Folks, I don't want you to clap on this, but is it just surprised you a little bit, my emotion, my excitement? I mean, that's, you know, I, that's what it is. That's what you've got to do. You've got to always be positive. People won't follow a negative, dull, disillusioned, frustrated, dadgum crybaby. You can't ever think about that football player laying out on the field, right? I was not going to let the folks in the wrong color jerseys see one of my guys lay on the field, seeing them hurt, seeing them give up. I wasn't going to do that because if you see the enemy, if you see them hurting, that's when you get a little 
burst of energy, right? And then you really want to squash them and step on. Ain't that right? Well, you ain't doing that to me. You ain't ever seen me hurt. You ain't ever seen. I might hurt. I do hurt. I cry. I doubt. I fear. I get scared. I get negative. But you ain't seeing it. And Prudential damn sure ain't going to see it. Right? Right? See, I coach a clear and powerful vision. I said yesterday, a team is all of the team, all the teammates that are focused on a common vision, right? You've got to have a vision that's clear and powerful. And A.O. Williams, we had 50% of our vision when you joined this team. I want you to know you're joining some great event. This is some great happening in our country today. We're probably not going to make it. The odds are probably 99.9% against us making it. You understand that? It's probably just like this, the odds of us making it. But we got a chance. And if we make it, it's going to be huge. And you're going to look back at your life and you're going to say, man, I was part of something great. We did something great. And 50% of it is building financial independence for your family. You're not coming in this thing to make Art Williams a hero. You're, you're, you're coming in here to make you a hero. You understand that? You're coming in here to make your family financially independent where nobody would have their thumb to put on you, right? And to build leaders that have that same kind of opportunity, right? You got to have a vision that's clear and powerful. Number 11, I, I coach the tougher the better. I coach the tougher the better. Old Ben last night talking about his hair, you know? You, you know, really, folks, I'm, I'm so fanatical about this because I used to see at ITT, I would be out there like you, and I had this speaker up here, and he just looked so pretty. And he had this tie on, you know, with these cufflinks. And this hair, just like Ben's hair, just beautiful hair, you know? And, man, he could just talk and talk and talk, and I was sitting out there, and, and I would just look at him, and I'd say, Art, you were just cursed. You, you know, you were just cursed. I mean, look at your body. You ain't got no hair. You know, you can't talk like that. You know, you didn't have a college degree. You ain't ever gone to a business seminar. Look at that guy's got it all. And I was just dying. And I did that for, you could quite frankly, quite a few years. And uh, then I won. And those kind of people just sort of dropped by the wayside. I mean, these people that I thought were, had more advantages than me, I kept stomping on them. I kept whipping them, you know? And then I found out that smart people and pretty people and people with hair and people that business degrees and all these advantages that I thought were advantages are really handicaps. Because when, when, when you get to a crisis point and you got to get down there and in the midst of all the crap, right? When you got to shovel the crap day after day. When your best guy quits and leaves you a $10,000 roll up, right? Then I think people that, that, that have advantages on the outside, they just can't muster up that toughness that Art Williams was able to muster up. I love the toughness. So you see, A.O. Williams was built from people that looked sort of average and ordinary on the outside, that had been scarred, that had been put down, that had been, they, you, know, you know how companies or bosses or, or, or teachers look at you and say, you know, you're not one of them, the, the blessed people, the gifted people. I had that all my life. But I had Coach Taylor. Thank goodness it's tough. Folks, don't ever apologize because it's tough. Don't ever apologize because the first 18 months, everything turns to crap. Don't apologize because you're going to have some of your, your best guys quit, that you're going to have clients say no, and that all the life underwriters are going to say, 
you know you're scum. And that your office is a trailer hitched up to a car that's outside the city limits of the town. It's here today, gone tomorrow. That the Better Business Bureau is going to issue warnings that says don't do business with A.O. Williams. Right? Bring it on. Bring it on. Bring it on, Prudential. Bring it on, New York Live. The tougher, the better. Right? Give me everything you got. I want everything you got. I, number 12, I coach character. I, I coach character. See, folks, I really believe long range. If you don't have some character, you're not going to win. See, see, I, I really believe you got to stand for something. I really believe that. Now, most companies don't believe that. You understand that? Most companies in, in, in American business, they don't believe character counts. They don't, they don't really believe you got to put the consumer first. You understand that? You see, most people like my old buddy Tom Hopkins, you know, these kind of guys. I mean, they really believe if you're, if, you, if you're slick enough, if you're really slick enough, if you know how to ask the right questions and answer the right questions, and you're really polished and poised, that, uh, that you can win. Well, see, I, I believe your reputation is everything. See, I disagree with, with slick, with tricks and gimmicks with fancy this and that. See, 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 I believe you got to be right. And, and I believe your reputation is everything. And I believe if you don't do, if you don't do what's right 100% of the time, then you might get by for one day, one week, one month, one year, but sooner or later they're going to smell you out. Well, buddy, when you represent A.O. Williams, you don't ever have to back in the door. We stand for something. We draw a line in the sand. We believe in buy term and invest the difference. And if you don't like it, you step over that line, then we're going to go to fighting. And if you want to fight me, it's going to get ugly. And you better bring your lunch because we're going to go all morning, all afternoon, all night, all the next day, and all the next day. You understand that? I stand for something. And let me tell you something. One of the saddest things I see in this country it's when you stand for something and you, and you stick your head up out there and you want to make a difference rather than applaud you, the majority of people out there are going to pull you down. They're going to try to knock your head off. They're going to try to say something bad about you. But let me tell you something, folks. The only alternative to being controversial and people talking about you is to be average and ordinary. Call me anything but average and ordinary. I stand for something. I coach character. N number 13, I coach values. I coach values. I, I try to tell my new recruits that, 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 that I expect three things from me and them. Number one, I want, I, I want to do what's right 100% of the time. Number two, I want you to do your best. I want you to give it everything you got. When I put the uniform on, I'm going to try to give it everything I got. I mean, I've tried to give you everything I got. And number three, treat others the way you want to be treated. Sounds simple, but folks, if you do those three things, do what's right, do your best, treat others the way you want to be treated, then folks, you got a chance. You got a chance. I coach values. I want to be a company of values. I want my leadership to have values. I want them to stand for something. I coach number 14, the power of purpose. See, I, I want you to feel like when you're coming on our team, I want you to feel like you've got a life of purpose, that you're really making a difference in the world out there. So see, see the purpose in A.O. Williams, our purpose, our defined purpose in A.O. Williams February 10, 1977, was to change people's lives. Folks, if you think we're in the insurance business, you're thinking screwed up. If you think we're in the investment business, you're thinking screwed up. We're in the business of changing people's lives. We're in the business of taking hurting people out there that have been abused and put upon and giving them hope again.
giving them a real opportunity again, a chance to believe in themselves again. This is a big deal. I coached a purposeful life. I'm going to give you a purpose. And our purpose at A.O. Williams is to change people's lives, to push people up, to treat people good, to make people feel special, to help people solve their financial problems, to help people build their own company, to help be people become totally financially independent, to help people hope again, to help people dream again. And you know what? At A.O. Williams, not only do we teach people to have a purposeful life, where it's more than a business, where you care about each other, where you love each other, where you believe in each other. But we also created a reward system that paid you to do that. See, at A.O. Williams, you can't be a Lone Ranger and be the biggest guy. To be the biggest guy, to make the most money, to build the biggest team, You've got to have the most people have the most success. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't it wonderful to be in a company where you have a purpose? I coach the power of purpose. I, I coach how to keep it simple. See, the, see, see all, the, all the learned people, all these brains, these college professors. Can you imagine? I mean, I pretty much covered the waterfront in a day and a half, right? I mean, what do these professors do for four months? I mean, they talk about a bunch of crap. Ain't that right? 99% of it's crap. It's just busy work. Ain't that right? I mean, that, that's, what, that's what Tom Hopkins and, and uh, Stephen Covey and all these people do. They have these seminars. Ain't that right? I mean, they got to go fill up enough time where they can charge what? $200 or $300? Ain't that right? So they got to go fill up a notebook and they got to give. Ain't that right? Well, I try to make it simple. I don't want people to look at me and say, man, I can't ever do that. I can't ever do that. I can't ever be that good. I mean, if you're trying to build a team, you want to simplify things down where people look at it and they say, anybody can do that. Man, that's a piece of cake, right? Anybody can do that. Well, you know what you got to do? You know the way you, you build a team? You always in your warm market. You, you never get on a cold telephone, never knock on a stranger's door. You never even have to set up an appointment. You get in your warm market, you go re recruit. You're the best part. We got the best part-time job in the history of the universe. You understand that? There ain't nothing even runs close second, right? And everybody needs extra income out there, right? So I'm going to go give you the best part-time opportunity in the world. And you know what you're going to do? All you got to do to get started in this thing is, is, is you got to, everybody's got a few friends. I hope you got a few friends, right? I mean, they, they really like you. Yes. Really? Yes. They don't think you're a scumbag? No. Right, okay. So all you got to have is just a few friends that think you're a pretty good guy, that you're pretty honest, good family man, got a little character, right? Yes. You're that kind, right? Yes. Your wife loves you. Yes. Your kids love you. Yes. Right? You got a few friends out there that think you're pretty special, right? Man, you are in for a, a wild ride. We're going to have so much fun, you ain't going to believe it. Because you know what you, all you got to do is call one of your friends and tell them you got somebody you want to meet. And you know that somebody's me. Now, man, I'm special. Ain't that right? Right. I mean, what, 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 wouldn't you, you'd be honored to take me to your friends, right? Huh? Sure. Yes. Right, huh? Ain't, ain't that right? Let's go now. Let, let's go now. <laughs> ain't, ain't that right, man? They, they say, right, we're going to have so much fun, you ain't going to believe it, right? Yeah. And, and um, see, all you do is call your friend. You say, I got somebody I want you to meet. I mean, this opportunity is going to change your life. Do you realize I was just, I, I did this for two and a half years part-time when I was coaching football, making $10,000 a year. I saved over $42,000. You know, what, what if you just use this part-time job and you just got out of debt and you could tear up all your credit cards? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Well, you know what? Why don't, why don't we make that your goal? Why don't we make that your part-time goal for you to get totally out of debt? Right? Let's do it. Tear up all your credit cards. And you know what? You don't have to do anything that's going to ever make you uncomfortable. You don't ever have to talk to a stranger. You're not in sales. 
you, all the ugly things, people not going to say you're an insurance agent, you know? All you do, we deal with a warm market and we deal with friends, best friends of people like you, just good family people like you that want to make a difference. And, and you call your best friend on the phone and you say, I got a friend I want you to meet. And then I'll come by and pick you up or you come by and pick me up and you're going to take me to your best friend's house. And then I'd like to walk in the back door. I mean, I want it to feel like, uh, you know, it's a friend coming to see a friend, right? So I want to go in the back door and I want you to love on the kids and I want you to, you know, warm the house up, you know, and I want you to take me to a place where they, where they congregate as a family and have fun and watch TV and do all that kind of stuff. You know, the den or the kitchen table, you know, where they eat every day, right? Don't take me in an old living room, <laughs> right? Or no dining room and, and sit me on some old cold furniture, right? I mean, all you got to do is call your best friend. You just tell him you're bringing somebody over to see him. You go with me so I don't get lost. And you warm up the house. And then you got the number one stud in the world that's going to recruit him, right? And I bet you he needs extra income, right? Yep. Right? Is he a pretty good guy? Yeah. He got a wife. Yep. Got some kids that like him. Yes. Right? You, you think he might have a few friends? Yes. That think he's okay? Working for somebody that thinks he's okay, yep. right? And so what we going to do, he's probably got some debt too, right? So, 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 so I'm going to offer him the best part-time opportunity in the world, just like you. Right? And all he's got to do then is call his best friend and set up an appointment. And I won't go with him. And, and, and I might be, I don't know. I don't want to sound like I'm bragging, but I'm pretty good. Okay. <laughs> I want you to know that, right? Okay. And, and I'm going to go, I'm going to go sell for you and I'm going to go sell for him. And you're going to make money off when I say, I, you ain't doing nothing but sit there and smiling. All, all you got to do is smile and cheer every now and then, you know, say, man, I don't, I don't, I don't, unbelievable, <laughs> right? That's all, that's all you got to do, right? And you got to act like you're excited, right? And you ought to be because you're going to make a couple hundred dollars, right? Yeah, For doing nothing. I mean, I mean all you got to do is pick up the telephone and call and say, I'm bringing somebody. Ain't that something? Yeah. And I'm going to pay you $200. Ain't that ridiculous, huh? <laughs> and then... We gonna hire your best friend before we leave tomorrow night, and then he's gonna call his best friend, and and I might even take you with me to see him too. You know, we'll we'll all three go over there, right? And we'll see him, and he's gonna make some money. I'm gonna sell for him, and then you gonna make an override off what we say. Ain't that something? That's and true. then you know what? He's a pretty good guy, right? Yeah. Huh? He got a wife. Yeah. Kids, Couple kids, two of them. they like him. Yeah, yeah, okay. I mean, he's uh, uh, goes to church. Yep. I mean, he's probably got five or ten people that like him. Wouldn't you say? I bet you something else. I bet you he's got some debt. Yeah. When you think it, you think he'd like to pay off some debt, right? Yeah, he would. I got the best part-time job in the world. So me and your best friend gonna go to his best friend, and you know what? We gonna offer him the best opportunities in the world, and then he's gonna call his best friend. Ain't that something? Yep. So see, I coach keeping it simple. I coach keeping it simple. I, I coach number 16 playing by the rules, playing by the A.O. Williams rules. See, A.O. Williams, we, we have some rules. We sell term in church 100% of the time. We say what we mean and we mean what we say. We have no protected territory. You know, A.O. Williams has some rules we live by. Well, I had a funny thing happen. You know, uh, Jose Rivera, you've heard that name. Uh, his son, an A.O. Williams baby, was put on the Wall of Fame, I think, the last convention. And, uh, but Jose was in the insurance business like old Ben. And uh, we were getting ready to open up Puerto Rico, and Jose made an appointment to come see me. And so Jose, uh, who's my good buddy, we became best of buddies, but he comes in my office. He flies over from Puerto Rico to Atlanta, and he comes in my office with his three-piece suit, you know, really looking nice. You know how Jose can look. 
And uh, he sits down, he starts talking to me. He pulls out a sheet of paper from his coat pocket. He says, now, uh, Art, if I, you know, to open office, I'm going to need this much money. I need this for secretary. I need this for phone. I need this. I said, time out. Jose, we don't do that. You understand we got 10 times more business than I thought we'd have. I'm killing myself right now. Bo Adams is killing himself right now. Just to get the money to keep this thing going, you know, and getting the computers and all this kind of stuff. Do you understand we don't pay nobody expenses, Jose? Everybody pays their own expenses, Jose. Now what you need to do is stick that list back in your coat pocket and get on that plane and head back to Puerto Rico. And he was stunned. And he got up out of his chair and he went down the hall and Bob Miller headed him off, you know, got him in there and calmed him down a little bit and brought him back in. And then he became a giant in A.O. Williams. And his family got involved. Not only did Jose become uh, financially independent, but I think there's like 20 something people in Puerto Rico right now that are making six figure incomes. See, I teach people, we got some rules and we play by the rules. You, you know, number 17, great coaches and great leaders always lead from the front. You, you know, I think uh, one thing you ought to feel good about when I talk to you about something is, is I did it. I mean, that, that gives you some credibility. Do y'all, did, did I buy that or am I wrong about that, right? Huh? I, I mean, a guy like Hopkins, I mean, he's prettier than me and he can talk to you about all this crap, right? But, but if you were betting your life on somebody, right? I mean, you, you know, like Coach Taylor said last night when he called me in before he's dying, you know, you, you are here for a flicker. And it ain't going to be long. They, they're going to be planting you in the ground, correct? Patting you in the face with a shovel, correct? Ain't that right? And there's going to be a tombstone over you. And it's going to say one or two things. Here lies a dud or here lies a stud. Now, folks, what's your tombstone going to say about you? So, you're here for a flicker. Who you want to listen to, somebody that's done it or somebody that's studied people that's done it and comes up with this sharpened saw and all this kind of stuff? Hey, ain't that right? Ain't that right? Well, folks, you want to build, you become a do-it-first leader. You lead from the front. Don't you ever ask your people to shovel the crowd. You shovel the crowd first, right? Whatever you want your people to do, you do it first. Number 18, I promote more losers than anybody. And people that don't know what they're talking about, they think they only promote winners. Let me tell you how this came about. Is when I was at uh, the, the regional vice president, uh, Waddell and Reed, there were 13 regions and the Southeast was on the bottom, had been for years. Within six months or so, we had become number one. And then within a year, we were like this and everybody else was way down here, you know? So when you're like this and everybody else is way down here, what do they do? You come at they talk about you, right? And, and they try to nitpick you, right? And they, and they say everything they can possibly say bad about you because it makes them feel good, right? And they say, well, part-timers, you know, they don't know nothing. They ain't trained. Um... Art Williams just recruits a bunch of people, throws it against the wall, some stick, some don't. Uh, bad persistency. They're going to say all kinds of bad things about you, right? I want to promote more losers than anybody has in the history of the world. You understand that? Because there's a ratio out there, right? And all you can do is all you can do, right? All I can do is give somebody the best opportunity in the history of the world, right? And then prove myself that it can work, right? And if I can get one other person to prove it can work, then buddy, that takes all the excuses out. Ain't that right? But A.L. Williams was built for the two percenters. W what do you want me to do if you, if you lose your best guy and you want to quit? What do you want me to do? You want me to quit with you? You want me to sit there and, and put my arm around you and, and it's mesmerized with you for uh, 
Or, or do you want me to grab you by the shirt and say, let's go hire two more people. Let's go promote. That's what I used to do. If I lost one, I'd try to promote two. I wanted to send a message out to my team that that guy's got to pull his own little red wagon, right? And if he's got something better than A.O. Williams, then that's wonderful. You go do it. That's, you ought to do it. That's what I do, right? But, but this is where I'm doing my thing, right? I pitched my tent at A.O. Williams. I ain't going. So if you want to go, great. What can, I, what, what can you do if somebody wants to quit? Well, what can you do about that? Or all of a sudden you're going to quit? Are you going to get a, a bad attitude? Are you going to quit promoting people? All you can do is all you can do, right? I had somebody at the last seminar said, Art, um, I've been criticized in the company because I had two, two people succeed. I don't know if they were talking about promoting RVPs or just general people, in it, but I had some people fail. And, and, and what do you say when people criticize you when uh, you know, a lot of the leaders fail? And she, it was a her. She said, my income is way up. And my two leaders I promoted are doing fantastic. But all everybody talks about is how many losers I had, how, how many failures I had. See, every place is supposed to work. Everybody you, everybody you promote is supposed to love it like you, right? They're supposed to work like you, right? They're supposed to be tough like you, right? They're supposed to make money like you, right? They're supposed to get promotion like you, right? But most of them ain't going to do it, right? But what you got to do is keep promoting people, right? And they got to pull their own little red wagon, right? After a while, right? I mean, they got to get to a point where they say, this is where I'm pitching my tent, right? And all you can do is win yourself, right? Become financially independent yourself, right? And then try to get one other person to do it. And then, folks, I, I don't know anything else to do. I don't know anything else to do, and I'm not listening to any crowd, right? I mean, I have, I have people criticize me, and they say, well, Art, you know, every Monday morning, man, I was making some decision, and then next Monday I was changing some decision. Buddy, let me tell you something. I'm going to get under your skin. You understand that? We're going to keep this thing moving. Hey, ain't that right? And as a leader, sometimes you have to make some controversial decisions, and some of your teammates don't know why you make it. Ain't that right? But you keep calling those decisions, right? And... All I know at the end of the day, I had the highest hierarchy. I had the biggest hierarchy. I made the most money, right? And so you can, if you want to nitpick me, have at it, right? I mean, you want to say he did this, he did that, he did this, but I, I made the most money. I built the biggest hierarchy. I had the most people make the most money, right? So folks, don't worry about what people say about you, right? Do it. Hey, be better than that, right? You go win. Then you go get one more person that wins. And then you take that opportunity to the world. And you call those plays. And you make exceptions like old Ben. You know, you make exceptions. Sure, you want to promote somebody. Like, like I always believe, promote somebody just a little bit earlier. That's one way you build those relationships, right? I mean, it might be 30, they got to earn it, but it might be 30 seconds early or two minutes early or one recruit early or one uh, division manager early, right? And then if somebody wants to criticize you, have at it. Hey, I want that. You understand that? If people ain't talking about me, I ain't doing nothing. Ain't that right? I want you to talk about me, right? See, I coach winners. I coach people how to be winners. You know, I want you to win in all areas of your life. I coach people how to win in their personal life. I coach people how to win maybe in their spiritual life. I don't know if I do a good job of that or not, but, but in, their, in their business life. I want you to win in all areas of your life. I found that almost everybody almost does enough to win. In my 37 years in this business and seven years in coaching, 44 years, almost everybody does almost enough to win. But the winners do it. Now, 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 now what do you, how do you define do it? What does do it mean? Like Tom Hopkins says, Art Williams says do it. I'm going to show you how to do it. 
Well, all I know is winners do it. Now, what do they do? They do whatever it takes, right? I mean, it's important when uh, you lose a sale, a guy says no. It's important that you've got the courage to suck it up and go back out and make another sale, correct? When your best guy quits. It, 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 it's important that you have the courage to call an emergency meeting and talk to your team and, and give them confidence that you're going to replace them and we're going to go on and we're going to do it, right? You, you don't just run and hide and hope things are going to be okay, right? Winners do it. What do they do? They're just a, a million things. You can't define it. It's not important what you say. It's important how you say it and when you say it. Ain't that right? There's nothing magical about closing a sale. You don't do that with tricks and gimmicks. You can. But that's not important. I showed you a presentation on a, on a napkin. You can give the most wonderful presentation on a napkin. You don't need all, right? Ain't that right? Winners just have a way of doing it. Now, now does everything work out for a winner? No. 120 plays in a football game. Only four or five plays are going to decide who wins or loses, right? See, that means, folks, 95, 96% of the play, that 97% of the things you do out there ain't going to work right. Most of the people you recruit ain't going to stay here long range. Most of the RVPs you recruit are not going to work out to be financially independent, right? But what do you do? You just keep calling those plays. You just keep doing it, right? You just do whatever it takes. You just do it and do it. And do it 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 and do it. And when you lose a sale, you just do it. And when your best guy quits, you just do it. And when Prudential raises his ugly head and says something, you just do it. And when Mississippi outlaws your product for two weeks, you just do it. Is that right? That's right. And see, I found in my life that most people, 98% of the people, they won't do it long enough. They almost do it long enough. They almost do it with enough passion. They almost do it with enough toughness. They almost do it with enough enthusiasm. They almost do it with enough excitement. But the winners, what's the difference? What's the 2 percenter got that the 98% of them doesn't have? The two percenter just does it. He just keeps on doing it. He just does it and does it and does it and does it and keep calling the plays and calling the plays and believing that the next play is going to win. That's why we're together. That was my inspiration. What you saw these last uh, seven or eight hours, I just shared with you my life. I shared with you my experiences in A.O. Williams, thank goodness 98% of the people out there don't want it like I want it. Thank goodness the pretty people and the smart people, thank goodness they got to go through the same mess that people that look like me got to go through. That's it. That's my story.